This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 154 of Horsemanship Radio brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we take you back to that little girl mind whose world revolves around horses and the real happiest place on earth. We'll tell you about that. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, who makes all those. How are you, Jen? Hello. It's nice to talk to you again. Oh, it is. It is. And I thank you again for producing our shows I so love, faithfully I and loyal. The show. There's such an enormous broad swipe across the horse. <laughs> We do. Well, you, you get people from all sorts of different corners and nooks and crannies, and then you get the ones that are the big famous one. Everything. Like, oh, it's I'm, who I I'm, like to talk to. Spoiler, Disney. Hello. Oh, yeah. Yes, they have a big horse. name. Yeah, they have a big horse connection. Name. Yay. And they're big horses. Really big horses. Really big horses for a really big place. So that's pretty darn exciting. It really is. You know, we all think of Disney as the happiest place on earth. But you know what? The place where they train the horses is not right on campus there. That's the real happiest place on earth. It's really cool. You'll you'll love hearing about it. I'm going to hear about that. And you also have one of my favorite authors on who chats a little about how horses are emotional sponges. They suck stuff up. So fascinating con- conversation with Krista. But before yeah. we get to Krista, who is our first guest today, the movement, this is the movement version three. Is this the third year or the second year for the movement? It is 3.0. Yeah, we're on our third annual. And just because we went to three days. No, actually, we, we were two days the first year, 2018, two days the second time and that was 2019 and so we went we kept getting all this feedback like we need more <laughs> so we're we're actually adding more horse work to it too oh, because uh oh yeah i mean we had amazing speakers we we didn't want to cut back on that because everybody loved the content but we want to see more horses actually delivering the content it'll be a very visual more so than ever event so and temple grandin i mean is that not like a coup to have her as our 2020 visionary and uh, and having her and dad work together is just that's been a dream of mine to get that recorded and and done you know so that's check that box it's going to be so much fun i mean anybody who doesn't know temple should first rent the movie i think it's a netflix movie called by her name temple grandin and claire danes acted in the movie and by all accounts temple said claire danes was her during the movie so it's not one of those wow where'd that come from this was actually her story and and done well and i think people will have even greater appreciation for Temple when they see that. And for dad to be able to walk uh, to walk and talk with a flight animal who knows English is going to be really fun because she, you know, she will tell you what the flight animal's brain is thinking with authority. And that's what dad loves about her so much. So he can say, hey, I have this theory that the horse is working, you know, through this. And she'll say, yes, no, maybe. But she'll know with authority whether or not that is within the behavioral spectrum or not. Because her autism. colliding in the best kind oh, of way. Yeah. I don't even, in the best kind of a way, yeah. I, th- I really think that it'll be spontaneous and unscripted and all those things that you hope when you're working with horses that will, you know, at the end, like everybody will have this little light bulb over their top of their head going like, that's what that meant to be in the behavior and why you train your horses this way. You know, I was talking to Jamie Jennings this morning, host of Horses in the Morning, and she's going to be out there with us too. So I'm real excited about that because she's Monty Roberts instructor. So she'll be out there, all the muscle memory out there working with these horses too and demonstrating. And she was saying how she was reading 
this uh, thing on treat training and and she finally got it what dad was saying when he said no blade of grass ever runs from a horse and so horses behavioral or motivational system is not like that uh, because they don't have to stalk kill devour their prey like uh, like a carnivore and so for her to say oh i finally get it I, it just shows that it's there's layers and layers of why you know dad teaches these things and why the behavior is so important for us to know you know so so the movement is coming up in june at flag is up farms in california yeah. so for yeah. somebody who's going hmm this looks interesting give me an overview of what happens at the movement okay yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So it's three days and it's a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And that's because Temple could come on the on Tuesday. And so we stacked it backward from there for the three days. And people can expect, to, number one, you're traveling to a tourist town, which is kind of cool. Um, it, we're in central California, Solvang. A lot of people know it for its Danish community. It's a tourist town. You've been there, Jen, yeah. And right. It's pretty and the weather's always nice and it, uh, you know, lots of places to stay and things like that too. So it's a comfortable place to come to, first of all. And then um, when you land on campus, when you come into the gates of Flag is Up, we want to, from the gate, start your experience. We want everybody to decompress. I think that's been one of our top compliments is that people just, the gate opens and they go, ah, oh, and they're there for themselves. And that's, that's what we're, tr we're really setting out to achieve and we've been able to achieve it is that you took some time away from the devices and, you know, all the hectic that goes on at home and set aside some time to just soak in that feeling that we love about being with our horses. A and you're going to go out with an understanding of why it worked that way. Frankly, we're going to bring speaker after speaker. So you will start in the round pen. Dad's going to do a join up demonstration and talk about the language of Equus and how the flight animal is motivated. And we've had like Hannah Selleck, Tom Selleck's daughter in there sacrificing herself to do the first join up of her life, you know, in front of the public that she's so brave. And, and that's kind of fun too. So we do have a little celebrity angles to it too, but mostly it's it's one presenter after another who's focused their vocation or they've used horses in their lives to um, to achieve better behavior from their horses or better results from their horses. We have Dr. Madison Siemens, who is a, a vet coming from the Idaho area, who is really a sage. He's a cowboy poet and funny, but he also is very geeky. You know, he loves to tell you about the ocular situation with horses and why they could be spooky or not. And um, so I'm really pleased to have him. We have Dave Mokul, who is, um, he's an author and teaches at Stanford in mindfulness. And he teaches us how to focus when we're around our horses. We have a chiropractor coming from England who's going to teach us how to breathe around our horses. And so it's, it's really about the health of the person more than it is about how we're going to train horses. You know, there will be a lot of training, but it'll mostly be about understanding to train, you know? So well, I hope if, that makes you, sense. Yeah, that makes Fun. absolute sense because okay. horses are trained through body language and you have to learn how to be aware of your body and train your body. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. I'm very absolutely. excited about it. Yeah, I'm really excited. Sometimes I get like, I'm all over the place because I, right now, you know, we're at that final presentation, putting the agenda together. And so if people have feedback for us on what they want to see, the each one of these speakers is super multi-talented, too. And they're asking, what direction do you want to go? And we're like, oh, my gosh, there's like 12. So many you know? <laughs> <laughs> so many choices. It's really fun. Really fun. But back to today. I'm, back to as today. I got segued there. Yeah. Training Disney's horses and horses and emotions. It really kind of all fits in. There we go. And we're going to hear from our first guest right after this from Omega Fields. At Flag is Up Farms, we've used Omega Fields horse shine for years and we love the results. And we're not the only ones. Rita Vaughn has this to say about her experience with Omega Horshine. I have a five-year-old colt that I raised. For the past two years, he's been struggling with an extreme allergy to fly bites. So bad, he has chewed places on his body raw. I had tried everything to relieve this colt of this extreme allergy. My vet this spring recommended Horshine. 
I began using your Omega Horseshine product about six weeks ago. Total change in this cult. 80% of the itching has stopped. I'm figuring with continued use, it'll be 100%. He's a Palomino. His color has become beautiful golden. I can't believe the change. I'm truly thankful for this product. Passionate about horses and science from the time she was riding her first Shetland pony in Texas, Krista Leste Lasser writes about scientific research that contributes to a better understanding of all equids. After undergrad work in, and studies in science, journalism, and literature, she received a master's degree in creative writing. Now, based in France, she aims to present the most fascinating aspect of equine science, the story it creates. Well, welcome, Krista Leste Lasser. What a beautiful name. And you're coming from a beautiful country. Where are you right now? Thank you. I am close to Tours in France. Oh, that is nice. But you weren't always there. You're a Texas girl. I don't even hear it in your voice. <laughs> I've kind of lost the Texan accent. Yes, I grew up in Texas near Dallas, and then I moved to France uh, 22 years ago and was staying in Paris for a long time. But uh, it's hard to be close to the horses in Paris. Mm. So even though there are a few horses in Paris, and so I decided to move out to Tours, which is uh, in the Loire River Valley. Terrible life, Krista. We're all jealous now, but <laughs> that's not the reason. <laughs> I, I didn't want a, a, a tourism moment here. I am excited to talk to you about this article. So I'm reading along, and I see a title that perks my ears up, and it says, Horses are Emotional Sponges, and I've just been working on a thing called Riding Styles, and we're talking about uh, personalities and body language and traits and things like that, too, so I'm always intrigued by some science, and an emotional uh, reading of horses is always fascinating, so tell us how you came to write the article. Well, actually, that uh, is uh, the work of Léa Lansad, who is a French uh, researcher, also at, working out of a uh, tour. Um, and so she's not very far from me, but I've been working with her for several years because she always does some really fascinating work with horses. And I think what, something that's really great about Léa is that she's very humble because she is learning so much about horses along the way herself and is changing, you know, she's a horse owner and, you know, is like, like this, you know, wondering things, questioning, well, what if my horse is this? What about this or that? And those that questioning then leads into very practical and, and very interesting research projects that she leads then uh, there at the University of Tours. So most of the stuff that she does has to do with, you know, just the relationship between humans and, and horses. And this one was just a really pertinent one. I just, when I saw this uh, come across my desk, I was like, wow, this is, this is what so many people already know or suspect, and it's so great to have the science behind it that says, yeah, you're right. Your horses do pick up what you're feeling, and they are paying attention to your emotions. And in fact, they're paying attention to them more than we even thought that they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love evidence, you know, and, and when somebody works as hard as she has to, to do a science trial like that, I'm glad you picked up on it. And isn't it it's serendipity that you're in the same town together, too? So let's let the listeners in a little bit on what this article was about. It, it was an experiment between, were they photographs or posters or video of people? It was uh, still images. Still images, okay. And the people's faces were expressing kind of extremes, as I remember. That's right, yeah. They were either showing very positive emotions or very negative emotions. So, for example, you would have somebody who is elated with joy, very happy face, or you would have somebody um, very angry. Angry faces, and yeah. And so these, both of these, these posters would be hanging up uh, where the horse could see them, but in different directions. One would be on his left and one would be on his right. And, and as you can imagine, I've, I've seen some other studies done before. And in fact, we have a school in Solvang, California, where, where the students that are more advanced do projects, school projects, you know, and some of their projects are on how horses react to colors or uh, different photos of animals. And it, it is fascinating, not very scientific, but it, you know, it's, it's a, something they can do as a report. But what I found yeah. fascinating about this one was that as you might imagine, the horses were evasive of an angry face or they were 
more relaxed, their heart rates went down with the the more relaxed faces or the smiling faces, I guess. Right. But intriguing is that when you had the sounds added, that put a different dimension on it altogether. Can you describe that? For it, yes, it did. Yeah. Right. Well, so what Leia Lamb said and her team did was then, you know, after they had these posters hanging up for the horses, they could see either one. And then they played a single voice recording of somebody and not the same person actually that was in the picture. They didn't want to have that confusion. So they had a different person uh, recorded making either a very happy vocal sound or a very unhappy vocal sound. So for example, you would, and she didn't want to have any words. She didn't want to have any language involved mm. to, because that would just add an extra complication into yeah. the, into the data. So she just kept it nonverbal and it would be somebody saying, you know, maybe laughing you know, ah, ha, ha. and then maybe somebody else very angry or growling, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and so they, observed how the horses reacted to hearing that sound. And we might initially think, oh, you know, horse should match voice to to the image. And if they they hear a a happy voice and they should be looking at the happy person, that that would be logical. But actually, that's not logical for horses at all. Mm -hmm. They looked at the opposite one. And before anybody thinks, oh, horses are not intelligent, (laughs) that's Hmm. really not the case. This is this is exactly what horses would do in any kind of situation in which uh, something is unusual. It's out of the ordinary. That's what horses do. And they, they look at, they look when, at a flag uh, that, that suddenly got put up in, in your yard that wasn't there the day before. They're going to be okay. looking at that. And that, this is what they were doing with this. Saying, hey, this doesn't match. There's something weird here. Okay. And they were looking at the wrong face that didn't, the one that doesn't match the voice. And so that was interesting in the fact that it also sh- it, it shows some of this equine cognition, and the way that they think, and, and but also perhaps more importantly, at least in this particular case, it showed that the horses really are able to understand the expression of human emotions, and yeah. they they pick up on it, they're paying attention to it, and they're paying attention to it well enough to even recognize incongruities such as a face that doesn't match the sound right. that they hear. Isn't that fascinating? So I think what what's intrigued me the most was this wasn't even about them necessarily. You know, it wasn't like we're going to take a horse right. and yell at them or we're going to take a horse and say, ah, you know, it with smiley face in front of exactly. them. This was sort of a detached. What's your take on it? horse standing there, you know, very interesting that they would react in, in the incongruity, as you said, um, of the photos to the, so what this is, it, this is like, Hey, parents don't argue in front of the kids, you know, like, because exactly. They yes, that's right. Pick up on that. Right. So that if you're Absolutely. having, Absolutely, they do, they pick up on it. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Because what, what we're seeing here is that not only are they picking up on it, but as you mentioned earlier, they also have changes in, in heart rate, the changes in behavior. They're, they're reacting. They're, they're paying attention to it. They're noticing it. They're observing it. And they are reacting to it. So if you show up in a bad mood and uh, you're on the telephone having an argument with your significant other, don't do it in front of your horse. Go somewhere else. <laughs> you know, and it seems... In a way, it seems maybe ridiculous, and at the same time, it makes perfect sense. It, it, these, are, these are sentient beings, and we have, over m- many hundreds, even thousands of years, we've been domesticating them and, and selecting them, having them live with us. Um, they, these are animals that are used to paying attention to us. They've learned to live with us. And they become sensitive to our emotions. And, and there may be even, you know, much more to it. Maybe it would be interesting to see where the studies will go from here. Will they then start testing in them on do horses react more to voices of people that they already know? We already have some sort of research like that, but I'm talking about specifically in this particular context of matching the face uh, with the angry voice or the, or the happy voice. Will they make a distinction if it's a voice that they already know or or, or not. And the reason for that is that we already are seeing in other studies, for example, like uh, Paolo Bagley in uh, University of Pisa has been working a lot on, uh, and, and Antonio Lanada, they're also in Pisa. They've been working on horse human heart couplings. When horses, humans spend a lot of time together, they, their heart rates seem to line up. Absolutely. And, and so these, you know, these all, all these, re- these research studies all work together 
to say, yeah, these horses, they're, they're connected to us. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're connected to us. And especially, I think, you know, if their welfare is good, they're even going to be more connected to us. And they're going to perhaps even be more intelligent. The work of Constance Kruger in, in, in Germany is showing that horses that have good welfare are, are more innovative. They, they, they seem to be, show more signs of creative intelligence. So uh, it would stand to reason also that if their if their welfare is good, they're they're going to be more observant, maybe more, more using their minds more. I guess you could say, which could yeah. also mean that they are paying more attention to what we're doing. So if you've got a happy horse <laughs> and uh, that you get along with really well, and then uh, you know you're not having a, a good day, you know avoid yelling in, in front of them. And you know I, I don't think that means you can't go and cry to your horse over a, a broken no, heart. No, I, I hope think, not. You know, that's still allowed. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> I think that's still allowed. But 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 yeah, definitely recognize that what you do is going to have an effect on your horse. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that that works in a positive way too. Show up with. Uh, with your horse with a with a show up to see your horse with a smile, and and a happy voice and and the uh, you know hi uh, hi solstice that's the name of my horse hi solstice how are you today so good to see you, and that makes him quote unquote happy, yeah you know yeah absolutely and more trusting and and everything else that goes down the right pathway and and I love that. Right now, we're starting to turn these science trials around. I mean, let's just assume, you know, we've, we're all mammals and we're, you know, we all have so much alike in our survival mechanisms and other things that we deal with. But we're starting to think, you know, what we should be doing more of is studying how humans react around horses. <laughs> you know, I'd love yes. to quantify that more. I mean, the science trial we're working on right now with veterans is studying how humans react around horses in general. And it, and what it does is it raises awareness of how we are. And, and horses are, are just fine, right? They, they want to have a low adrenaline rate. They want to be chill and be in a herd and trusting each other. It's us humans that have to get it better and writer. So I, I hope we can learn a lot from just studying them and then emulating the horses and, and what we can do about that and not affect them in a in a negative way. But really interesting. I'm so glad the horse published your your article. That's what I read it in online. And <laughs> and I, I hope people will go find more articles that you've written. I, I went down the rabbit hole a little bit too and they're really good. So Krista, I appreciate what you're doing for horses and better yet, what people so that we can learn more about the horses we love. Well thank you. Glad that you enjoy uh, my work. That's, that's I, great. I'm glad that it's getting out there and, and that people are, are being able to benefit from from the science that's going on out there. Yes, I think so. Because that's what the scientists hope most of all is that the work that they're doing actually does finally get to get to the people who who are working with the horses. Yeah, that's absolutely. their ultimate goal. Well, I hope you will. I hope you will pass on our um, kudos to your scientists <laughs> there, and uh, keep up the I good will. work. Anything we can do to encourage and please share. Um, come back, and we'd love to have you on again. Well, thank you. you. Guys, yeah. All right, thank you. Crystal, Great. So thank you very much. Stay less air. Kavala Horse and Rider offers a wide range of innovative products that provide comfort, protection, support, and value for you and your horse. Kavala's easy-to-use, economical, and effective hoof boots are available in three styles and six sizes to fit your horse's hooves and your riding style. Kavala's got your back, too, with their Total Comfort System saddle pads for English, Western, and Tucker saddles. Look for Cavallo's simple, sport, and trek hoof boots and saddle pads at your local tax store, or you can visit them online at cavallo-inc.com. Aaron Simons grew up in Southern California and remembers very early on asking to have a horse or to take riding lessons. When in the second grade, her parents relented and offered horseback riding lessons as a reward for improved school grades, she was hooked. She was 10 when she bought her first horse, and who he eventually became her children's first horse as well. Aaron has had the opportunity to train in multiple disciplines and compete across disciplines. Riding defined her childhood and young adult years. 
Her career with Disney started in 2003 as a stable attendant with the opportunity to work with the resort in many different roles since then. Well, welcome, Erin Simons. I'm so happy to have you on this show. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having us. Oh, you know what? It's been so much fun because we've been working on getting together on this for a while. I got to visit the Circle D, what, a couple of months ago now, I think. And it was really hard for me to sit on my hands and not tell everybody about it because I really wanted this to be a fresh interview for that. So that it's just such a privilege to be able to see where you are and what you're doing and how well you do it with all the horses. And I think every horse lover who's ever visited Disneyland is curious about all everything about the horses because we want to know how you find them and how cool is that job and you know all those things. So how cool is your job? I always tell people that my job is the best job ever and someone has to do it. So I will volunteer to do it as long as I get to do it. But thank you so much for those wonderful compliments. We love the ranch and we love being able to share it with friends at the ranch. It's really, it's a wonderful share. I love the whole, we'll talk in a minute about how you found it and, you know, and how nicely set up for the horses it is. But the first thing I'm curious about was the horses and, and I learned a lot on your tour. So I appreciate that. But how much training is involved in these horses that you acquire or do you, would you prefer to have them untrained and you guys do most of the training? That's a really great question. In fact, it's one that we get especially from people whose horses we are looking at as prospects for the ranch. Mm. We spend an incredible amount of time doing very detailed work with every horse, regardless of whether it comes already trained to do a task or a job, or if it comes without any training and it's a green, you know, coming three-year-old. We always take the time to make sure that we start from square one because we want our horses to feel comfortable and confident doing their jobs. We ask them to do a pretty big job because they come out to Main Street and there's lots of distractions and there's lots of sensory input, as we call it. So it's really important that when we're giving them a foundation, they learn everything that they can as far as durable and confident in their own skin and with the tasks that we're asking them to do so that those tasks are even mundane and kind of boring when you're, you know, blasting music and you have a live band and you have rolling trash cans and they're like, yeah. this is nothing, you know? Right. So it's, it's different for every horse. We make yeah. sure that, yeah. we, you know, you've got to cater to each horse. So there's no, so you, you don't take line. the owners, you know, on face value that uh, they tell you they can do all these things. You actually start from scratch then just to see what they're made of. Right. I love hearing the perspective of what people, because they know their horses and they love them. Um, And so I love hearing what it is that they um, tell us they're capable of doing. But for our own purposes, we always just pretend they know nothing. Um, And sometimes that's more or less to give the horse the benefit of the doubt. Because when you have a personal horse, you're training it for a task that you personally want to do. And that's different than the task that we're going to ask them to do here. So we want the horse to have the best benefit of the doubt and know that we're we're here to make sure they're comfortable and calm and feeling collected about what it is we're asking them to do. Yeah. I, you know, they must be very chill to begin with, or you probably wouldn't even consider them. So what are some of the unique markers, some of the temperament markers that you look for in these like gentle giants that they are? They are. And we, first of all, we're lucky because draft horses, I know we see them in these, you know, big hitch horse, eight or six up hitches that we're seeing them at a show and and they've got lots of energy and they're really, really exciting to watch. But for the most part, they have great, just gentle and, you know, sort of low energy personalities. And so we really look for a horse that is thoughtful. That's my very first thing that I want to see when I'm looking at a new prospect is what do they, how do they react to things and what is their thought process? You know, if I ask them to do something they're unfamiliar with? What is it that they, what's their first reaction? Are they going to think through their reaction? Are they just going to, you know, react and be nervous or, or scared of something? Um, Mm -hmm. So really, truly, my very first thing is, are they thoughtful? Do they think through their reaction? And then we kind of go down the checklist from there. Yeah. And you're hands on, you're out there, you've got this big arena, as you can imagine, for these big horses too. You're out there working with different sensory overload things like uh, bags on a stick. What, are those some of the typical 
um, desensitizing, if you want to call it that, tools that you use? Sure. We use anything that you can imagine and then things that you probably wouldn't imagine. Oh, like um, what? So we, <laughs> we use these rolling dollies that my, you know, my husband uses for construction, but we use oh. them and we put all kinds of different objects on the rolling dolly and then we drag it around like it's our pet. And the horses get to follow it and experience whatever it is that we decide to put on it. Sometimes it's confetti and sometimes it's balloons are tied to it. Sometimes it's a trash can. Sometimes it's a snare drum that then we drag it around and bang the snare drum while it's, you know, bumping over the dirt and making all kinds of noise and racket. And the horses eventually just think that we're crazy and look at it like, here they go again. Um, but if you can imagine the first time they see it, they don't think that that's so, you know, cute occasionally. Yeah. But um, but what we're trying to do is help them understand that what I want you to do is not to immediately react. I want you to look at this object that could be frightening. Um, and I want you to be thoughtful about how you're interacting with it. And a lot of them, we're so lucky. We have great horses and we have great cast members who train these horses and they're all patient and everybody, you know, comes to the right conclusion in the end. Some take longer, but all of them, you know, understand it and they get there and it's really special to see it happen. Yeah. It was fun to tour around when you were taking us around and just see the other cast members, the the people that are working with the horses too. Um, mostly you guys were in the barns and stuff. It's not like it was a really windy day. So we weren't out there working with the horses or anything, but you could tell everybody really cared. And, and I think they could all tell that they had the coolest job on earth too. And I love that we were there when the farrier was there and that's, that's an, an amazing thing in itself, watching the farrier deal with these, these dinner plates for feet and this just the sheer size of them and and you guys take such good care of them but i imagine you're under a you know microscope anyway so i don't know why you wouldn't but i can vouch for you you guys take wonderful care and i love that you're working with their brains so much as well that's kind of what we're all about and um you had a thing called the gentling room which you took me in which was pretty exciting you want to talk a little bit about that some of the contraptions were in there. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, we, that's our, our trainer's room that you're talking about. And it has, we have some bins that are all full of things like plastic pools and pool noodles, tarp, different kinds of balloons, different kinds of sticks with, you know, bags or streamers, or there's some snare drums and different instruments, tambourines, all kinds of, you know, fun things inside of there and it's loaded with we have all the saddles and bridles and all of the you know um, harnessing equipment and that kind of stuff but um, not your typical tack room just not your <laughs> it's a little bit of a no, surprise yeah. you go in there. <laughs> uh, but you, you told me the best story and this really tweaked my brain is that in order you've got a new newer horse uh, coming into the herd the group the string, whatever you, what do you call them when they're out doing their job? And I said, what happens when the fireworks go off at Disney? We all know that, you know, that, that culmination at the end of the day, that's just amazing. And you said, that's when they take a nap. Mm -hmm. Now tell me yep. why, why you said that. What's, what's the story behind that? That's what tweaked me. Well, we used to live on property. Our ranch was on property just behind Frontierland and tucked in next to Toontown. And one of the reasons why we were really excited for the opportunity to move off property is because our horses lived right next to where we launched the fireworks, which isn't bad for them health-wise because they were very, very used to it. But um, for our cast members, it, you know, you have to stay and make sure you watch over them for, for fireworks and then make sure everything gets tidied up and cleaned up and then you're leaving. And so it was just a great opportunity for our horses to be able to have a more quiet environment, but yeah. the way that it's unique to think about is they adapt so easily. So when fireworks would go off shortly before fireworks, we have this restriction of vehicles backstage so that we can prepare everything and make sure that it's safe and ready for the fireworks to launch. And mm -hmm. that is when it's quietest. So our horses understood the routine that about, you know, 30 to 45 minutes before fireworks, it was so quiet backstage <laughs> and all of them would lay down and take. Them. Yeah. So the most I've... fun thing is that when we get a new horse, we sort of use, you know, good old peer pressure to help them understand that the fireworks really aren't going to harm them and they're just loud. So we usually put them right in between 
two of our um, more reliable horses who will literally just nap during fireworks and they go to sleep. And then this, you know, poor newbie standing there like, Hey guys, <laughs> things are noise floating in the on. sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the other two kind of just look at this new horse, like, uh-huh time for a nap. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you kind of watch them. It's, it's sort of the same realization that you get out of a child going to school for the first time where they sort of just figure out how to get into the, you know, uh, tied with everybody. And this new horse does the same thing. They kind of look around like, well, why am I freaking out? Nobody else is. Nobody else is. So, I know. I love that. Yep. I love that. I love using, you know, the maturity of other horses to do that too. You know, a lot of people will pony from a geld, an old gelding that, you know, has been around and everything too. So brilliant on you for using that factoid about horses that they will, they will teach that way. I can almost see them roll their eyes sometimes, you know, just like, oh, kids, oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> but speaking of the, the tack room is pretty cool too. I mean, those harnesses, as people can imagine, are huge and heavy and they, there's such a history in them. Some of them are really old and cool, but it made me think when I went in there, I thought, okay, you guys must pass some like weight tests, like firemen have to do too. Cause I don't know how you lift them. <laughs> how do you guys get into shape enough to, to lift them? Well, and you saw my cast members. I have a range, so I have tiny little petite gals yeah. and then you know, tall, big, strong folks. And so they, the, the nice thing, as you know, about men and women is that they're tough and resilient. And if you task them with something like throwing a harness over a 19 hand, 2000 pound horse from the ground, somehow they are going to figure out how to do it. That's and they true. all do. They, they all get it done. But you're right. We have, we use two different kinds of harnesses. We use a farm harness and we also use what we call as a street harness. So we use those two different kinds, just depending on what fits the horse the best, depending on what fits the, what the horse is doing the best. It, it's all very much um, focused on making sure that the horses are our number one priority and that their comfort and care and their being our, our number one priority when we're looking at all of the things that we do with them. So, and our cast members are the people who make sure that that happens, but they are tough and they can, some of those <laughs> little girls, you don't want to you don't want to cross No, them. I'm sure I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they are tough little cookies and they can they're, get all that. They're done, with so. police and firemen and cast members. That's it for me. <laughs> but yeah. so, yeah. yeah, I don't know if the, the Norca, so you, you alluded to the fact that you moved to the Norco property, uh, what, a couple of years ago now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it's open to the public or do you just have private tours there? I feel very blessed to have done it, but how, how do you do that? We actually don't open it to the public, mostly just yeah. because it's a working environment and I have cast there who are trying to get a job accomplished. And we sure do ask a lot because we've got, you know, 18 horses and we want them to all get exercised and manipulated during the day so that they are kept in the greatest of shape, but do accommodate with certain tours depending on where they come from. And one of the things that we do get to do, which is a great experience for us, is we're involved um, with giving tours to the community and the community members. So what we do is we work with the city and we have some senior communities that come out and we get to work with some schools and they get to do tours and come and see the facilities. But we unfortunately don't do public tours that the public can come and sign up for. Figured that's what the answer was. So you have to move to Newark to actually ever have a chance to get in there, which is great or know somebody. But, But I thought it'd be interesting for people to know a little bit about how intact that farm house and property is that you you are such a good neighbor that you moved in there and really into a historic piece of property and kept it pretty much like it was. Do you want to tell that story? Sure. We love history and heritage. We actually are one of the few groups at Disneyland who can talk a lot about where our history and heritage came from within the resort and within the planning of Disneyland, which is really fun and it's a unique thing. So When we started, we started in what we affectionately call the Pope House, and that was Owen and Dolly Pope's home that they got to live Disneyland in and raise their family prior to moving to Walt Disney World to do the same thing for Walt Disney World and start a Circle D farm there. So one of the things that was important to us when we were looking at properties and looking at, you know, manipulating a property or or having it work for what our program needs and desires were was to make sure that if we're looking a home, which is kind of like the home that we landed in, that we keep it 
like a home and that we keep the history and heritage intact for it. And we found this wonderful um, five acre piece of property in Norco and this beautiful family had owned it before us and they had had a chicken ranch and then they had Christmas tree farm and they were, you know, grown up in the house and, and now the children who owned the house from their parents were selling it. And so it was really fun to listen to their history and heritage and be able to keep the house all original so that when we have tours come in, we can share that with them and talk about what the property used to be mm-hmm. and what we use it for now um, and be able to show them what the house you know, looked like then and keep it that way. And so the house is all original, it even has its original wood floor. And we have really been able to share that with folks who come out and see it. And we have this wonderful photo of the whole property from, you know, up above. And we can see where the chicken houses Mm -hmm. were and where their home was. And it's really just a neat thing that we get to share. And we get to continue even, you know, almost 65 years later. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful that you have a community like Norco so close to to Anaheim, too. Uh, it just worked out that way. They call themselves the horse capital of the USA, I think, of America or something like that. And it, it is really fun. Horse Town USA. Okay, there you go. Horse Town USA. Thank you. And they have hitching posts in front of the, you know, 7-Eleven. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a really nice tribute to the horse, I think, in Norco. And they're keeping it that way which is really fun. And I, it's just a perfect fit for you all. And I, I appreciate that you actually do keep that legacy going for not only the Pope family, but for horses in Norco and part of the Disney family. Very cool. Yeah, we love it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I, I so appreciate this is the cap to, you know, one of those dreams that you have as a kid is to really find out about the horses at Disney and and the history behind it and actually get to touch them and and see that they're you know just all the animals that you thought they were and more and the people behind them and you guys are amazing people behind them and I appreciate that all you're doing and I know the future with Aaron who's very young still is it's going to be a continued legacy I appreciate that thank you so much and it was really a pleasure to have you come out and be able to see it you know you always see other people's farms from afar and wonder what's going on there and how are they doing it? And so it was really fun to have you come and be able to see even just a little part of, you know, what we do. And you're right. It was really windy. So we didn't get to do as much fun (laughs) stuff, but um, we'll have to try and get you back when we can do that. Dang, I'll take you up on that. That sounds really fun. And you come to Flag is Up Farm sometimes in Solvang too. We got a little legacy thing going there too. We were built in 66 and we're trying to keep you know, the same kind of history behind us too, and keep it in the family too. So I appreciate what you're doing and hope more people will do that with farmland. It's very nice. All right. Thanks again. We'll have you back on Horsemanship Radio as soon as we have a new story to tell. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than The magic in the language of the Dear Monty, there is a growing group that seem to say that any method that is not their method, which they term positive reinforcement, is wrong. Their method is clicker training, to the best of my knowledge. I must admit the results look great, and I support any good nonviolent training method, but I really object to the inference that any other method is wrong. Their method involves treats, nonstop treats. And as a Montessori-trained teacher, this kind of motivation goes against the grain as the ideal would be that the student would respond from an intrinsic desire to do the right thing and not for a treat. I don't know enough about it at the moment as to say if this is the case or not. Best wishes, D. Monty's answer. First, let me say that horses are flight animals. They never stalk, kill, or devour any other species, which means that it is difficult to make a case for food being a reward. No blade of grass ever has run away from a horse. They don't need to stalk it, and they will have difficulty considering it a reward. Treats are, in my opinion, the best method in the world to train a horse to do one certain behavior, and that is the best method of training a horse to bite their handler. Have a look at clicker trained horses fed treats and you will witness an enormous group of equine individuals who consistently bite their handlers. 
It is also true that most horses who bite are also head shy. This makes sense because the human who is bitten will generally slap the nose of the biting horse. And it's my opinion that marker trainer training can also be effective. I would explain that the marker, not the treat, indicates the behavior witnessed is desirable. For the flight animal, it's my position that food is a bad reward. I have my own set of markers and reinforcers, but I would rather not begin to describe them because I believe that they are actions that might vary greatly from trainer to trainer. These markers and reinforcers are actions of mine, which clearly communicate acceptance of the action. It is my position that these markers are extremely important, but what they are is far less important. Markers should never be violent. I mark bad behavior with nonviolent actions, which must be completed within three seconds of the behavior expressed. In behavioral science, this method is PICNIC. PICNIC is an acronym for positive instant consequences, negative instant consequences, and the word definitive is instant The nick can never be violent and the pick cannot be food in my world. My students say I've created many of their own picnic actions and I enjoy studying their various mindsets. My studies in behavioral sciences clearly define for me that food for the flight animal, particularly the grazer, is not a positive action. Any action that results in weakening a behavior falls squarely on the area of the consequences. A positive plus consequence is when we add an action that results in lessening a behavior. A negative minus consequence is when we take away something that results in lessening a behavior. Sincerely, I could write a full book of my 80 years of discovery regarding the training of horses, which follow the scientific patterns that I was taught in four different universities. Please don't feel like I believe I have all the answers. Each one of us is still working at getting our training right for the horse. From Monty. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. A couple of years ago, I don't know how long ago it was now, mm-hmm. but uh, we we uh, had you on a, a number of our shows talking yeah. about the Equus Online University, which had just yeah. come out. It has developed. It's become better with the search engine in it, and it's become better with the forum because we have such an amazing forum. You know, a lot of those forums, people get on there and go, oh, no, you're not. Yes, you are. No, you're not. Yeah, usually it's, it ends up with the whiners on forums. <laughs> exactly. Right. And it's not. What I see is a mentoring. Actually, it's it's almost the polar opposite because um, the we, we do give these rosettes out for people who've completed so many lessons. And uh, once the rosettes started, now we have... Uh, we're up to five rosettes uh, for somebody who's watched every lesson. And you you have those rosettes by your forum uh, personality and your profile. And uh, so you can really see who's watched all these things. So it gives them credibility when they come in and say, hey, if you watch this lesson. So people come on there and they're using it as a, um, as a training tool, frankly, you know, and they get on there. And... I, and I'm not bragging on on the university as the greatest training tool, which I think it is, but it's also a great place for people to be mentored as they begin their journey with horses. Um, it really, it really is cool. So when they watch the lessons, and they can watch them over and over again as many times as they want, they get the lesson notes, they get audio, they get visual, and then they've got the forum to kick around too. Plus, we've got now since 2004, every week. Without fail, we put up a Q&A from Monty himself. He chose the question, he answered it, and we put it in a database. And that's actually free for everybody to search and get to. It's it's open on our um, Equus Online University. In other words, it's a non-subscriber open source forum too. Uh, not forum, but a Q&A base. Uh, the forum is not. You're, you're behind a subscriber wall for the forum just so we know who's talking. But it is... Um, it is it's been an incredible experience, actually, to put these together with Stefan Peters and Will Simpson. You know who I'm talking about. These these guys have won everything yep. in their worlds. And uh, Charlotte Bredals and and if I get started, Rich, Richard Winters and so many guest lecturers that are on there, too. So some people ask, why is it called university? Well, that's what a university is. It's uh, it's not just one opinion. It's not just one deliverer. You know, and, and I think that's the difference between the uh, everybody is putting out a YouTube 
YouTube these days and they're free. So people ask us sometimes, why do you charge like up to $10 a month? And well, it's, it's expensive to make the university. Everybody knows quality is, is, uh, not cheap, but it, it's really our mission statement. And I know that sounds a bit trite, but it's true. <laughs> when you, when you've worked at it for five years, just to get all that quantified and on there, they're just almost no subjects we haven't covered at this point, but um, but dad and I were looking at the list and he goes, Hey, I'm going to be making videos until well into my nineties. And I went, yes, so, <laughs> promise and sign here. <laughs> so, so we do have, we do have a lot of subjects left to go and a lot of people we want to still get on there. What do you think of it, Glenn? Well, I think that one of the things about training horses as it, same as training anything really, no. uh, is that you're, you're going through stages and you're always coming up to a new problem to solve uh -huh. or a new issue to deal with. And what I like about the university now that you have so much content on there mm -hmm. is that whatever issue you're running into, there's going to be something on there to help you. So not many people are going to go on there and watch all, you know, all the videos mm -hmm. uh, because there's just so many of them. What you're going to, what you're going to want to do is go on there and you're going to want to watch the videos that relate to the situation you're in currently with right. that particular horse. Um, and, and that's what I like about it is it has, it has so much content now that whatever you're dealing with, you're probably going to find an answer somewhere, somehow. And if not, you can go to the forum. Yeah. So, yeah, you that's know, true. that's what I, I really like about it is wherever you're at now is where you can find that situation. Plus, you know, YouTube is so full of crap now. And I'm not saying that every video on there is crap, but there are, we all know what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, there are some that are. And, you know, y one of the things that, I really like about this is you know you can trust it. Uh, you know that w what you're seeing is something you can trust. I've tried doing repairs on uh, appliances and things off of YouTube videos. <laughs> and, and you know, some of them are good, some are not so good. And some, one of the things I couldn't get back together again. So, oh. it was, you know, it's, you know, that. <laughs> At least you didn't hurt yourself. That's right. Good. <laughs> so that's what I really like about it. And for that, yes, it costs a few, it costs a few pennies to do it, but it's worth it. Uh, nice. you know, it's worth it to do it right. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And it is tried and true. Everything on there is so tried and true. If not, you know, we'd be, they'd be throwing tomatoes at us in the forum. <laughs> but it really does work. And, and we, we are so happy that, uh, so many people have been, um, interested enough at least to go there, you know, and I should plug in the, the website right now is, um, www.montyrobertsuniversity.com, um, because people can get a free day pass on there and go see what we're talking about and, uh, and check out that search engine too. You can put in the weird little keywords and you, you find all kinds of crazy stuff. It really is cool. And it breaks it down by, um, not just the lessons first, then it goes into the Q and A database and then it goes into the forum. So you can actually pick and choose where you, um, pick up those keywords from too. So, um, it, it's great. And then you also have little challenge questions, which I love the little tests at the end. You know, there's always four questions at the end of your lesson to make sure that, you know, you were, you were watching. And, um, if, if you get it wrong, it just says, want to try again? <laughs> and so you, by process of elimination, you get it right. And then it, it moves you on. And that's how you get your rosettes that you've accomplished that, um, that lesson and that you get to move on. But I, you know, what you just said is so important because when we were setting this, idea up. Um, nothing really existed like it. We didn't want it to be first you have to do one and then you have to do number two and then you have to do number three. And like it was some sort of programmed process. Yeah, because that, that never go. works. It doesn't. It, <laughs> no. you know, because we wanted people who were amazing trainers to jump in there and go, this is what I, you know, what does Monty say about this? Or what does this trainer say about that? Uh, and they could be at a world-class level, or it could be a very beginner saying, where do I start first? And you, you can just go down the lessons if you want. But you know, it's like you said, if all of a sudden you have a horse that won't load and you didn't have one last week that didn't load, you know, you go to the loading lessons right. and it's exactly. a whole series on it. And it's MontyRobertsUniversity.com. That's it. Yeah. Thanks for asking. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. March 6th through 8th, coming right up, we have a horse and sin healing for our veterans and first responders. Those are amazing. And we'll have another one, May 1 through 3, horse and sin healing in Solvang, California. 
Then May 14th, we're celebrating Monty's 85th birthday. There's a milestone. And then May 18 through 22, we have the advanced exams with Denise Heinlein. We're flying in from Germany for that and Monty. And then June 21, 22, 23 is that movement that we talked about. That's with Monty, Temple Grandin, Rick Lamb, and other outstanding speakers and trainers, too. That's at themovement2020.com. Then June 29th through July 3rd, that we'll have the Monty special training. And you want to know a little Portuguese if you're going to go to that one because it's specially designed for our friends from Brazil and Portugal. And then July 24th through 26th, we have another horse sense and healing. We're ramping those up. And then August 3 through 7 is the Monty special training in English extensively. And then August 17th through 28th is Gentling Wild Horses. That's It's so much fun. We get those untouched horses and we see more miraculous changes and transformation over two weeks. And then September 11 through 13, we have a busy weekend because we have both a horse sense and healing, and we have a CHA equine facility management certification course at the same time. At the same time. And you can find Mm -hmm. all of this and more on the website, montyroberts.com, or you can call the good folks at Flag is Up Farms, 805-688-6288. And if you couldn't remember that phone number, you can remember MontyRoberts.com and you'll find the phone number there too. So, ah, (laughs) for details about today's show, you can go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. This is episode 154. You'll find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. And we love your feedback. We would love to hear about what you want to hear about. You can do that on Facebook. Just type in there, Monty Roberts, like and follow. Monty is also on Twitter and Instagram. His handle on both is Monty underscore Roberts. And on to the audio aspect, get the app. That's right. Download the app, the Horse Radio Network app. It's easy and free to use. It works on Android phones and iPhones. Just download today. Go to your app store and just type in there Horse Radio Network and download it. And you can listen on your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes, Spotify, etc., Oh my gosh, there's so many. This is getting so fun. Podcasting is like... It's a thing. It's it's a thing now. Yeah, and our sponsors recognized it some time ago. So many thanks to our sponsors too. That's Omega Fields, our title sponsor. And then we have Cavallo Horse and Rider, they our make great show boots, sponsor. By the way. They make great boots, hoof boots. Yep, go get them. And then be sure to visit all the other great shows too on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, you know what to do. Have many happy horse hours.